All right. Welcome back, everybody, to Diabetes Bootcamp. This is our fifth session in this program. And today we're going to talk all about blood glucose monitoring, what we need to know about it, what are the numbers mean, how to interpret it, and use this to set the framework for problem solving and reducing risk, which are our final two classes in this particular program. So I want to make sure I got my screen shared here and everything's good. So I wanted to ask a few follow-up questions and you can type your answers in the chat or unmute yourself. And this is in relation to our homework assignments. So in our third class, Gina did a fabulous job talking about the importance of being active. And the assignment that you were given was to maintain an activity tracker. And what this activity tracker was really trying to do is, is just to help make you aware of all the types of movement you can do throughout the course of the day and how it all counts as physical activity. Remember, your muscles aren't really sure if you're in an exercise class or if you're just up walking around. So any type of movement that you can do throughout your day-to-day -day routine only is going to help keep your heart strong, but also keep your blood glucose levels within range. So what did you learn from using that tracker if you did it? Did you try any new activities? Did you know any, uh, did you notice any immediate impacts on your blood sugar? Let's hear it. What'd you guys learn? A lot of times when we're looking at tracking activities, it, it can seem daunting because, you know, when we're trying to establish um, new habits, it, you realize that, oh, gosh, I got to I got to make time for this. And that's usually one of the main reasons people give for for not getting enough physical activities. They just don't have the time. But remember, when we look at physical activity, any movement is counting as positive movement so we don't have to really think of it as full-fledged exercise but yes it can get get very difficult to to start that habit but i would encourage you as we look to really you know approach diabetes from from a standpoint of what what can i change to get the results that i'm looking for physical activity can be your secret weapon and all that a lot of times we'll give plenty of attention to diet i mean i'm a dietitian so i know all about how important that can be uh, and then Rachel did a wonderful job at medication, and there's a lot of attention on medications and the co-payments and what type of medicines can do what, whether it's insulin or a GLP-1 or an oral agent, um, and that's important too. But physical activity is one of those things that we all have access to. There's no co-payment. And when you look at the mechanism of action, when we go for a walk, it's the same type of mechanism that we get from a medication like metformin. It takes glucose out of the blood and shuttle it into the cells. So think of the activity in that fashion too. And that might help you from the uh, short-term motivation standpoint. But I would encourage you to try to maintain that activity tracker to see where you have opportunities to just get a little bit more movement each day. That's really all we're trying to get. So Moving ahead, when we look at monitoring, I wanted to share with you a different type of approach. So you can you can raise your hands, you can type it in the chat, but how many people have used the term testing your blood sugar? It's a very common approach, a very common way to phrase it. But what I'd like you to get away from is not using the term test and trying to get away from the idea that blood sugar results are good or bad. There's a pass, there's a fail. Really, when we look at blood glucose monitoring, and, uh, and each of you might have a different regimen that your healthcare provider is asking you to do as far as the frequency, uh, and as far as what those numbers are, are considered optimal for your particular care, 
But what I want you to remember here is we're just monitoring. You're just looking at the number and then asking yourself, okay, why do I think this number is where it is now? And, and what can I do differently? Just like you would pick up your phone and look at the battery and see that it's low and realize, oh, I better do something about this. Let me go plug it in. So there's not a there's not a good or bad approach it or a pass fail. So I really want to make sure you understand when we look at blood glucose monitoring, you're not having results that are going to be characterized as good or bad. They're just numbers. And your approach in terms of healthy long-term management of diabetes is going to be largely dependent on looking at these numbers and asking yourself, okay, what can I do differently if these numbers are not within the range that you and your healthcare provider have established? So why do we check it? You know, when we look at basic management principles, you know, if, for those of you that are in quality improvement and those types of departments, you know, they say what gets measured gets managed. And that's very true with blood glucose. We, we look at checking our blood sugar to make sure that, you know, we can detect any issues with low blood sugar. We can understand very quickly how certain foods might affect your blood sugar. You may have noticed if you're on a a regimen where you're checking blue, uh, blood sugar on a regular basis when you have foods like pizza or foods with a lot of fat, you might see a delayed uh, impact on your blood glucose. You can understand very quickly how activity might affect your blood sugar as well as any medication changes that your healthcare provider makes. So when we look at checking blood sugar, there's a lot of reasons why we're trying to do it, but the overarching goal is to try to make sure that we're keeping these blood glucose levels within range. Because what we know is that if they are outside of a range, and we'll go over some figures here in a moment, that is the number one risk factor for us for developing complications of diabetes. So when we look at heart disease and and kidney damage and nerve damage and, and delayed healing in the foot and, and gum disease and retinopathy, the common denominator in a lot of these complications is chronically high blood glucose. Just like we talked about in our first session, when your blood sugar is running high, it may not hurt, you may not feel it right away, but it can lead to a slow and gradual destruction of the small blood vessels throughout the body and that's why a lot of these complications are really the result of, of circulation issues. So that's what we're looking at when we're checking blood glucose. Now, how often and whether or not you need to is really a decision based largely on the type of therapy that you're on. If you're just on one oral agent like metformin, for example, which like Rachel talked about last week is the most common initial medication used for type 2 diabetes, may not be necessary to check your blood sugar at all. Or if you're checking it, maybe you're checking it once a week or maybe every other day. Your doctor will let you know how often to check your blood glucose. It really depends a lot on your overall treatment plan. Usually, if you're going to be taking any type of insulin-related medication, it's going to be very important to monitor your blood sugar. But outside of that, it's really uh, approached on a case-by-case -case basis. And the good news is, is we, for those of you that are under the Gator Care plan, we have also established some programs to make it a little bit easier to obtain those testing materials. So there's a minimal out-of-pocket cost for you. So that's, uh, that's uh, refreshing news, especially as we look at the prices of a lot of other things in life. So the numbers, what do they mean? When we look at numbers of blood sugar, what are we actually looking for? So it really depends on who you ask. So the American Diabetes Association has a set of guidelines that they recommend for target blood sugar levels. The American Academy of Clinical Endocrinology, they have different numbers, but they're all somewhat similar. But generally speaking, before meals, an optimal range is going to be somewhere between 80 and 130. Now, again, you might get more individualized guidance from your healthcare provider based on any other uh, medical history issues, but somewhere in that range is what we're looking for right before a meal. So this would be right when you wake up, but have your first meal of the day, or you know maybe before an evening meal if it's been several hours since your last meal. That's the target we're looking for. And second when we look at after eating, so about 
after two hours after eating, we want that blood sugar to be back below 180. Now, not initially, you know, when we look at eating right away, uh, we can see an immediate increase in blood glucose, but after about two hours, so let's say if you had lunch right now and two hours from now, you check your blood glucose, according to the American Diabetes Association, the recommendation is to have that blood sugar level less than 180, okay? Now, remember, if it's above 180, it doesn't mean it's bad. It just means there's opportunities to learn. Like, what could I do differently to make sure it's within that range? Maybe it's a matter of adjusting medication. Maybe it's a matter of reducing the amount of carbohydrate consumed. So there's a lot of factors that we consider when we look at translating these results into action. It's in a big, big part of our problem-solving um, session, which is our final session in Diabetes Boot Camp. So, yeah, you know, I'm a I'm a picture guy. I like to visualize things when we look at numbers like 80 and 130. Like, what does that actually mean? So I found a graphic that should help. So if you ever wonder if you check your blood sugar and you get a number, it's usually going to be milligrams over deciliter unless you're meters from Europe and it has some other type of uh, result there. But if you consider your your optimal blood sugar of 100, multiplied by the amount of blood you have in your body, about five liters for most of us. That means at all times we have about one teaspoon of sugar circulating around your bloodstream. So very, very small amount throughout our entire bloodstream, but that's what that would translate into. So just a visual to help you understand just how much uh, blood sugar is actually circulating through our bloodstream. I want to share with you some of the additional guidelines for the uh, uh, American Diabetes Association and giving close attention to the fasting, the before meal, the after meal, as well as the bedtime. So I talked about some of the ranges for fasting as well as what it should be two hours after meal, but also uh, around bedtime, we also want to try to keep it within uh, a range that's not going to be too high nor too low. So you can see how these ADA goals, as well as the American Academy of Clinical Endocrinology, you can see how there's a little bit different, a little bit more aggressive in terms of the target. And then also you can see how that compares to somebody without diabetes. So what their numbers would actually um, be, be um, obtained as far as their uh, blood sugar levels go. Sorry there, I got to make an adjustment here. So bear with me. All right. So everyone is different. When we look at overall blood glucose goals, so those are general guidelines that I just shared with you, but certain individuals might have different targets. Uh, if you're above the age of 60, um, your target might be a little bit higher to help reduce the risk of hypoglycemia. Uh, if you have issues in terms of heart disease or lung disease or kidney disease, that might also necessitate a little bit more liberal approach to blood glucose monitoring in terms of the numbers, as well as if you have hypoglycemia unawareness. So for some individuals, mostly individuals with type 1 diabetes, if you've had diabetes for a number of years, uh, you, become, you have an increased risk of becoming desensitized to some of the typical symptoms of low blood sugar. So you, you don't get the the perspiration or the, the the more obvious symptoms of low blood sugar and it just drops. So it could be 40 or or under 40 without you really even having any uh, demonstrable symptoms. So if you are somebody who's prone to more of that hypoglycemia unawareness, your healthcare team might aim for slightly higher targets for your blood sugar, both fasting and after meals too. So something to keep in mind when we look at some of the monitoring guidelines. And again, any questions you might have, type them in the chat because if you if you have a question, chances are somebody watching this recording may have it as well. So it's going to help them too. So I wanted to go over really something that I think is overlooked in a lot of doctor's offices if for somebody who's starting blood glucose management and that is how to check it. I mean, we have meters that are, are covered under Gator Care, and there's several other meter options out there too. But I wanted to make sure everyone understands that how to check blood sugar is pretty much the same no matter what kind of meter you're going to use. So meters work 
by having that test strip react with the blood to estimate glucose concentration. Okay, so that's essentially what's happening in that test strip. It can be very expensive because it's a pretty uh, uh, advanced process there when we look at the type of um, type of components that are in a lot of the test strips now. But here's here's what I do. It's like you don't have to use alcohol swabs to to clean your fingers. All right, you, you don't have to worry about that. All you have to do is just wash it with soap and water. You can use warmer water. That's going to help make it easier to withdraw a blood sample if you're somebody who is a hard stick. So if you're if you're not checking your blood sugar that frequently, maybe you're checking it once a week or something like that, and you have a difficult time getting a sample, make sure you're using warm water. That'll help a lot. So you're going to wash with soap and water and dry your hands well. Since this blood is interacting with the test strip, you want to make sure your hands are completely dry because water is also going to affect the integrity of those results too. So a common mistake I see people make is that they'll wash their hands, but they'll still be a little bit damp when they check their blood sugar and you end up getting a watered down sample or it's going to interact with the test strip negatively and, and not going to get an optimal result. So you put that strip in the meter and then you prick the side of your fingertips with the lancet. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a minute. You touch and hold that to the edge of the test strip to get that small drop of blood in there, and the meter will pretty much take off from there. Usually it's going to display your results in just a few seconds. So these are where you might see some adjustments as far as when to activate the meter, where to put the test strip. You know, there's some different nuances that depend on the type of meter that you're going to use. But by and large, wash and dry your hands. Use the side of the fingers with that lancet and apply that blood as directed with the meter. So here is your bonus question here. Why should you only use the sides of your finger? Notice how I didn't say prick the fingertip. You know, the fingertip would probably make it easier to get a blood sample from. But why don't we do that? Why is that not recommended? So if we look at the reason behind it, no one was brave enough to hazard a guess, and that's fine. That's what I'm here for. So when we look at why we only use the size of your fingers, because we have more nerve endings on those fingertips. So the more we prick the fingertip, the more likely we are going to damage those nerve endings and really make it difficult to have any feel of anything. So it's very important to use those sides of the finger for that reason, okay? Especially if you're gonna be checking on a more frequent basis. So make sure you're doing that as you're following through with any blood glucose uh, monitoring that you're doing at home. Now, what about the meters themselves? I mean, how accurate are they? You know, there's all types of meters that are available. If you go to the, the uh, pharmacy or you see them online, there's all types of different brands and, and varieties out there. The FDA clears meters based on company reported data. So if I were to go into the meter business and I had John's blood glucose meter and I would have to submit to the Food and Drug Administration my data on how accurate this meter is. And then again, there's no third party that's charged with approving that data before it's sent to the FDA. So you can't always believe everything that you get. So there have been secondary groups that have analyzed the accuracy of blood glucose meters, and I'll share those results in a minute. But in order to get the FDA stamp of approval on a blood glucose meter, 95% of all the meter values must be within 15% of the lab measurement. So meaning if you had a blood sugar reading done on your meter, and you also had some uh, a lab sample drawn, there can't be more than a 15% difference between those two numbers 95% of the time. 99% of the values must be within 20% of the meter value. So again, there is, there is uh, some integrity there with the numbers, but again, 
it is company reported data. The FDA is, you know, we've seen a lot of government organizations be, you know, become very, you know, thin over the years in terms of staffing. So uh, a lot of times it's good to have some objective third party uh, supervision of these programs. And that's one of the things that was done in a 2018 Diabetes Technology Society meter study. So they tested, I think it was about 18 different meters there. And what they found was a wide range of differences in terms of overall accuracy. So remember, the, the goal here, just from the previous slides, what you see on this slide here, 95% of the time within 15% of that value. And these were the meters that passed. So Contour Next, AccuCheck Aviva, the Walmart Rely On, the CVS brand, Advanced, Freestyle Light, and the AccuCheck Smart View. So that's, they passed because they all exceeded 95%. The ones that did not pass, again, this is in this particular study in 2018. It's not saying that it's the, you know, the end of the road for these other brands here, but you can see the ones that didn't pass, the one touch, the true result, the true track, uh, the prodigy, um, all are variations that didn't do well. And you can see the percent accuracy as you go down the list. So um, this one actually I never even heard of before, but the GMate Smart was only accurate 71% of the time. So these are some things to consider. What I wanted to let you know, and I think this is going to apply to anyone, whether you are or are not on Gator Care, is that the contour meter, which is now covered 100% by Gator Care with no copay, is also, fortunately for us, deemed one of the more accurate uh, blood glucose meters. So there's a reason this meter was selected as being the official, uh, quote unquote, official blood glucose meter for Gator Care members. So if you are a Gator Care member diagnosed with diabetes, you are eligible to receive this contour meter, either the contour next, which has got a, a Bluetooth sync with your phone. So you can kind of track your results on your phone too over time. And then there's a, a different version, the easy version, which is a little bit you know less bells and whistles, but they all work the same. Uh, all you need is a prescription from your healthcare provider. Now, in years past, we had different uh, lessons and modules that we would ask you to watch before you could get cleared to get the meter at no cost. But that was just a lot of those are just a lot of unnecessary paperwork. So now all you need is the prescription. You take it to any Magellan pharmacy. So they're pretty much all over the place, the CVS, the Walgreens, anywhere you're already filling any Gator Care prescriptions would actually qualify. Uh, all you need is that prescription. And you can also get a meter uh, for free just by calling that 800 number. Uh, a lot of times the pharmacies will sell the meters at a very, very inexpensive cost to like 10 to 20 bucks, but you can even save that by calling that 800 number, giving them that code and they'll send you one right away. And they'll do this once a year. So, you know, things happen. If you, if you, if you lose it or want one at home or one at work, you can have, you know, multiple meters over the course of, of several years, but also each of these meters are available for pretty uh, inexpensive out-of-pocket costs. And the good news is those test strips are covered 100% at no additional cost. So a lot of medications that we might take, whether it's for blood pressure or diabetes or cholesterol, they all have co-payments, but there's no co-payment for these particular test strips. So good information to know if you're somebody who is going to be needing to check their blood glucose. And again, I think it's important that you understand some of the resources available. If you want to uh, find out more about this program, some of the other details, you can just go to gatorcare.org slash test strips for, for more details. There is another type of blood glucose monitoring that's becoming more and more prevalent, not just in persons with type 1 diabetes, but persons in type 2 diabetes. And typically, uh, the ideal population here will be persons who are using insulin. And this is a type of technology called continuous glucose monitoring. You may have seen the Super Bowl commercial with Nick Jonas and his Dexcom. That is a type of CGM, a continuous glucose monitor. So what this is, is a, a wearable device 
that's tracking glucose levels 24 seven. And they'll send a reading to either a reader or a smartphone every five minutes or as you swipe it over the device. What it's measuring is not actually glucose in the blood, but glucose in the interstitial fluid. And they're closely uh, approximated in terms of how you can estimate blood sugar from interstitial fluid comparable to what you find uh, in a capillary or a blood vessel. So we, we can see very closely that they approximate one another and we can use the results of this glucose reading of interstitial fluid to also make treatment decisions. But what happened is you this tiny sensor inserted under the skin, it's there from anywhere from 10 to 14 days, depending on the type of sensor that is used. There's also an implantable one that's good for, uh, I believe, 90 days, or is it six months? You have to go to a physician's office to get that place. But same type of technology where there's a sensor measuring glucose in the interstitial fluid and transmitting those results to a, a reader device. And that reader could be an app in your phone or can be the reader that came with that particular type of CGM. So what the CGM affords you the opportunity is to learn not just what your blood glucose level is at a given point in time, but also where it's trending. Is it 112 on its way up or is it 112 on its way down? Uh, it minimizes and almost eliminates upon the type of system you're using the need for any finger sticks uh, when Dexcom first came out, you'd have to calibrate it by checking your blood glucose uh, with a finger stick, but now you don't have to do that anymore. So it's made monitoring blood glucose uh, so much more um, easier for persons that are, or, that are needing frequent finger sticks. Now, it's not for everybody. So the out-of-pocket costs tend to be much higher. Uh, it's best suited for those individuals who are on multiple daily injections, because if you're on multiple daily injections, you're typically also requiring multiple finger sticks, too. So those are the, the best type of, of patient to, to recommend for continuous glucose monitoring. The other thing that it's actually doing here is giving you an idea of another type of value that's become more and more asked about in diabetes care, and that is time and range. So when we look at blood glucose levels, they can naturally fluctuate all throughout the day. But when we look at for diabetes care is how often is it within that range? So the, the greater it's within that range and your target could be different depending on who you are, but somewhere anything of, above 70% is considered uh, within range, uh, an optimal amount of time. So this is how the CGM can help because it's also giving the individual time and range too. Now, if this is something that you think you are interested in, of course, you talk to your diabetes provider, your healthcare provider, uh, but also just to kind of relay this back to individuals who might be on the Gator Care Insurance, there's two main players out there for the CGM, and they're both pictured on the screen right there. There's Dexcom and there's the Libre. Dexcom is the one that's covered under Gator Care, Freestyle Libre, and then the one that's attached to the Medtronic Guardian uh, or the Medtronic Insulin Pump. Those are other options, but they are not covered under Gator Care. So just something to keep in mind um, in terms of those particular devices. Now, I will tell you from personal experience, I do wear a CGM. I use the Dexcom one that's uh, covered under Gator Care. So if you do have questions about it, I can try my best to try to answer them as far as operations and all the little, you know, uh, objective pieces of information. So again, any questions about that, I'd be happy to help, uh, you know, answer any broad questions as far as um, whether or not it might be beneficial for you, but also give you some facts about the systems too. Hey, Jonathan. Yes. Um, with the Dexcom, mm -hmm. um, you've got the Gator Care also, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, I had checked with the far the Shands Pharmacy here, and um, whereas it's a it's still a, a good product and everything, um, I was told that like it would cost us like sixty five dollars for, and then for the transmitter it's a little different also. So there is a little bit higher cost. Yeah. I don't know what you pay for it, but 
Yeah, and that's what I was saying. That's the potential. Yeah, so thank you for sharing. Yeah, the, the out-of-pocket costs are still higher, even with it being covered. I think, yeah, the copay that I typically pay, I think, is fifty dollars a, a month for the sensors, and it's like sixty-two fifty every three months for the transmitter. So there's two parts to every CGM um, operation. There's the transmitter and the sensor so the most cases the transmitters will last three months or so before they need to replace them. and then the sensor lasts anywhere from 10 to 14 days depending on the, the product that you're using but yeah even though it's the covered brand dexcom under gator care there are out-of-pocket costs to it as well so yes thank you now um when we look at other numbers, so that's the the bulk of, of blood glucose monitoring, but I want to finish up by just touching on a few other things to know and also give you an opportunity to we'll troubleshoot some real life scenarios here. So the other value that we often look at with diabetes care that's important to monitor is called the A1C. I think everyone understands what this number is now. I mean, it's essentially used as the benchmark for overall blood glucose management over a, a three-month period. So we use this A1C to not just diagnose individuals with diabetes, but also use it to assess blood sugar levels over the past two to three months. And what this is actually measuring is the amount of hemoglobin proteins that are coated with sugar. And so the, the blood sugar can fluctuate all throughout a uh, period of time, but it will stick to those red blood cells. So what this A1C measured is, you know, on average, how much sugar is sticking to these red blood cells. And we'll, we'll typically do this test anywhere from two to four times per year. Now, there are some limitations. And when we look at the limitations here with A1C, is that it's really just an average. So persons can have a A1C of 7%, but they're day-to-day -day readings could have significant fluctuations. So that's why when we look at A1C, especially for those persons who are on uh, multiple diabetes medications, I also try to look at it under the context of what their day-to-day -day readings are too, are too. The test only looks back at the previous three months. So if we look at the reason why that is, for those of you that are are top-notch in the field of hematology, you'll know that's because the red blood cell lifespan is only about three months. So that's why it's limited to just a three-month period. And really, much of what has been going on in your life in the past 30 days is, is, is the biggest influence on your A1C. So yeah, it does go back three months, but really the, the, the previous month is what tends to have the most impact on a person's A1C level. But again, it's a tool that is used in the context of day-to-day -day readings and other uh, diabetes tests to assess overall blood sugar levels. Now, when we look at problem solving with blood sugar, the things to keep in mind is that there are three key factors that influence a per person's blood sugar. We all know them, food, exercise, and diabetes medication. However, that's not it. I mean, there are other factors to consider. Stress, the time of the day, if you're under the weather, uh, if, you're, if you're not properly hydrated, there could be steroid medications you might have to take, and those side effects could impact your blood sugar. Inadequate sleep, all of these can impact your blood sugar too. So when we look at problem solving, which is gonna be a big part of our final session, is that's what we have to look at when we're trying to understand those blood sugar level numbers. Again, not that it's good, not that it's bad, it's this level, why do I think that is, and how can I make a change? So is it food related, activity related, medication related, stress related, sleep related? Only you know the answer to that in terms of problem solving. So let's look at some issues with blood sugar monitoring and kind of solve them together. I'm going to have uh, several scenarios here and you can think of it to yourself and maybe try to solve each of these issues. But we've got five different scenarios here. We got, you, know, you, you want to check your blood sugar after meals, but you keep forgetting that happens. You notice your pre-dinner blood sugar readings are usually above the target range. Okay, that's a scenario. Maybe when you're checking your blood sugar, people are looking at you strange in public. Say, like, what's this person doing? 
maybe when you check your blood sugar, it hurts. You stick in your finger, that might hurt a little bit. Or maybe you have a spouse that is just really <laughs> all about wanting to know what your results are and 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 might be a little um, boisterous in their influence on those results. So think about those scenarios and how can we address each of them? So uh, I thought about them and I, I came up with some ideas and I'm open to any other suggestions you might have too, but let's take a look at them. So if you're forgetting to check your blood sugar, I think one of the easier fixes there, if you like to use your smartphone for reminders, you can just set a reminder on your phone to boom, check your blood sugar. It's nine o'clock. You check your blood sugar after your breakfast. If I look at blood sugar readings and anytime mine are above the target range, I try to look back at what I just ate and to see if my carb intake was above average. Sometimes, you know, if you are carb counting and, and using insulin, it can be really tough to nail down that exact quantity, even for me. I mean, you think if anyone would have a, a, a more easy time with carb counting, it would be somebody who's a dietitian. But even me, I'm, sometimes I don't always understand the exact quantity, especially if I'm out at a restaurant and they're using a lot of sauces and things like that. So it's just all about trying to problem solve and not beating myself up if it happens to be well above that range. It's all about learning from that result. People look at me strange when I check my blood sugar in public. Well, check your blood sugar in a, in a restroom or a private space. I think uh, the, the side effect of an increased prevalence of type 2 and type 1 diabetes is that it's not uncommon anymore to see somebody checking their blood sugar in public. So I don't think you have to worry too much about those strange looks, even if you did do it in a more public location. Maybe when you check your blood sugar, it hurts. Well, there's a couple of things you can do here. One, like we talked about, less nerve endings in the tips. So that's also another reason to use the sides of your finger. You can also adjust the depth control on many of the Lancet devices that are sold with blood glucose monitors. So no matter what type of uh, Lancet device you're using, there's typically a dial where you can adjust how far into the finger that Lancet will go. So typically, the deeper it goes, the a little bit more painful it might be. And let's say you do have that spouse who just really wants to keep up with things and you just acknowledge their interest and, and just ask for their support in developing the plan for above target results or below target results. And I think that's a lot of uh, what comes with maintaining a healthy marriage is trying to understand, hey, look, I appreciate what you're doing. Here's what I could use for real help there. So some other numbers to keep in mind, and these are more from a, a general uh, perspective here, but we also look at blood pressure. You're typically going to have your blood pressure monitored in the office every time you go see the doctor. And if you do have high blood pressure, it is recommended to also monitor your blood, or blood pressure at home. Uh, lipid levels, so your cholesterol, your LDL, your HDL, your triglycerides, there are target ranges for each of those, but a lot of these targets also depend on any other risk factors you might have. So I don't, I didn't put concrete numbers there as far as what is considered within range, because there could be some variability there depending on, on what else might be going on with you. But it is not uncommon to have uh, a statin prescribed for individuals with diabetes who have LDL levels slightly above that range. Since the statins are deemed to be very safe uh, and there is a much higher risk of heart disease with elevated LDL levels, that bad cholesterol, uh, you'll see it's going to be quite common to be prescribed a statin. So just something to keep in mind. And of course, your weight, is it fluctuating? Is it going up? Is it going down? And, and what can we do about it? And then of course, sleep, optimal hours of sleep. I think we all know is seven to eight hours each night. And the less sleep we get, the increased impact on our stress hormones, which in turn can impact our overall blood sugar. And it's all tends to be related. So those are the key figures that I wanted to review with you when we talk about monitoring. I I would not not going to, you know, give you two weeks without homework. And this is a homework assignment that may not apply to all of you. So not everyone's checking their blood sugar. I'm aware of that if you're on metformin and 
it's you know probably not necessary for you to check it on a daily basis. But if you are, all I would like for you to do now is just maintain your own seven-day blood sugar log and note how certain foods and activities are affecting your blood sugar level. Again, it's all about having an approach where we're looking at it from a problem-solving standpoint and not beating yourself up unnecessarily if the results aren't where your healthcare team and yourself want them to be, okay? The other thing I'd like for you to do, if you're eligible, if you're somebody who's monitoring your blood sugar, is contact Gator Care. Join that next, uh, the Contour Next Test Strip program. And really, the way the program is designed now, uh, I should probably just update this particular side, is you don't even have to contact them. You can just get that prescription right from your healthcare provider, provider and take it to any participating pharmacy and get that test strip and the meter uh, filled. So that is all for today. As always, I will hang out virtually and answer any questions you might have. You can type them in the chat or unmute yourself. And then next week, as we approach um, looking at the last two weeks of this program here, where we go into problem solving, we'll talk about reducing risk. So we're going to take a closer look at more of these risk factors for diabetes and, and what we can do as far as preventative care. So this will talk a lot more about monitoring our lipids and looking at our feet and checking for circulation issues, some things to really keep in mind in addition to blood glucose control that can help lower our risk for complications. Can't hear you anymore. I know. I just realized I was muting myself <laughs> as I was talking there. You saw my lips moving, but um, mm -hmm. yes. So um, yeah, no problem as far as the blood sugar ranges go. The thing to keep in mind is that it does fluctuate significantly all throughout the day, and that there's also a little bit of margin of error on many of those meters too, just based on those numbers that we looked at as far as meter accuracy. What we're looking at, and this is where I think the future of blood sugar management is going to take us. And that's where we look at that time and range and, and understanding that, oh, my blood sugar is this right now, but what is it looking at for the entire day? You know, so uh, for me right now, my blood sugar is 152. So I had something to eat about an hour and a half ago. Not too surprised that it's still within that range. And again, it's all about looking at the number and trying to learn from it. And one of the other things to keep in mind, I mentioned some of the 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 big factors that influence blood sugar, but it's been estimated that there's like 40 other factors that can influ influence a person's blood sugar too. So not all of them are under our control. So I think what we do is you, you learn from your blood glucose, see if there's anything that you could have done differently for it, and then adjust from there. If not, then that's fine too. So we're looking at the big picture and say, okay, well, I had a, a blood sugar of, at 152 at this point, and if it remains elevated over a series of several readings, then I'll you know talk to my healthcare provider about what could be done differently, med medication adjustment or a dietary adjustment and what have you. But really, it's all about learning now to look at that result and figuring out what I need to do, just like you would do with your smartphone. If the battery is running low, it's, oh, well, time to plug it in. So if your blood sugar is running a little bit above range, it might be time for a walk or the same type of approach, problem solving and not beating yourself up over it and, and leading to, of course, anxiety. <laughs>